Great. Well, Karen, uh, thank you for taking time. Uh, we finally get to meet to talk about uh, your film that's coming out. Uh, and it, it's I got a chance to see it. And it's called Curse of Willow Song or The Curse of Willow Song. Excuse me. Uh, so I appreciate you taking time today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, so uh, as after I watched it, I was very excited to talk to you about it because I found it found it very fascinating. But what I usually like to do is, if you wouldn't mind giving my listeners a, a, a synopsis kind of in your own words, maybe what uh, The Curse of Willow Song is about. Um, okay, it's a young woman who has just gotten out of prison and uh, she is basically struggling as a like a new parolee and um, essentially she does not realize until like you know when she actually um sort of falls between the cracks things go sideways she ends up uh, having to live in sort of an abandoned warehouse and uh yeah she discovers that she has some dark nightmares that aren't of her own control <laughs> that's that's a good way to put it i uh, I'm going to say I went into the movie cold. I usually like to go in the movie cold. I know we get like PR and descriptions, but I kind of like going in cold because I like to, you know, w be surprised or, or what to expect. And, and your film very much surprised me in, in a, in a great way. I, I did not see where we ended up from where you start with this film. And, and I love that. I loved the direction you took uh so uh what what kind of influenced you with the story because you also wrote the story uh, what kind of influences in that uh what what you know what made you want to tell this story um i mean I had a few influences so look wise and feel wise i was watching a lot of really cool old like 1960s japanese samurai films mm. so a lot of the look and feel of it is like I was thinking about like Kari Neko and mm -hmm. Kaidan and uh, Ani Baba and that sort of thing. So that no theater feeling, like I love the, the, they're all in black and white. They have sort of a dreamy, soft quality that I really loved. And so that was what um, inspired the look of it. The character is from um, my work in documentary where I was actually following some female convicts, actually. Um, mm. they're, they're in female um firefighters who were like their inmates were learning firefighting so i was actually in oregon and i was following them and interviewing them and uh willow's character is sort of based on some of those interviews and then finally um i was watching i, I don't know if you're a big fan but i love dead files so i might be like that crazy person who loves dead files and one of the things that i had not really seen done in film before was um uh, psychokinesis mm -hmm. you know where you're actually creating dark matter from your own energy and, and that sort of stuff so that's where I was playing around with and so yeah just uh yeah anyway so that's the sort of the stew that actually is and then I ended up writing um a short story like a novella actually it's longer than a short story it's a novella uh, maybe 50 60 pages or so during the national novel writing month that I do mm -hmm. um, yeah, November if I can and then I it took me two weeks to write that because I what I tend to do is sort of like a stream of conscious writing sort of mm -hmm. stuff I get up at stupid o'clock write for a couple of hours and then you know basically have my breakfast and that would be my day um and I finished it early because it wasn't a full novel and I ended up taking the second half of the month to actually adapt it so it actually almost sprung from my head like um you know Athena coming from the head of Zeus you know like it just kind of <laughs> <laughs> or or dark matter coming from the the head of a a, a young woman uh, that, that too, yeah so it's always fun when you have a loose idea of where you're going but my favorite way like I used to as a writer um really be into like okay I've got this outline I've got it all plotted out you know that sort of stuff nowadays what I do is I actually tend to write myself a short story or a novella or something and I don't actually necessarily know where I'm going I've got some big ideas and bullet points but I love the chain of con like just that stream of conscious writing because it's sort of like instead of like writing to a beat you know like as writers sometimes we have an outline you're like okay here's the catalyst moment here's your blah 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 it feels a little less organic and I really mm -hmm. love being able to just like write it and kind of not know exactly where it is and then go back and adapt it so that's a it I think that's why when you said you were surprised you know what surprised me too so <laughs> I I liked it though because you you mentioned it being organic and it did feel like an organic flow and and once you realize kind of what's going on, um and, and I I kind of saw that influence too of uh 
you actually see it in in Asian horror quite a bit to where you don't quite get full explanation and and you might not get everything so you kind of have to put it together yourself in your imagination and that's what I liked with this is I figured out what was going on but at the same time you don't get everything how much of a challenge is that to you know hold the person's hand or allow your audience to kind of breathe and have their own conclusions you know what that's where the short story like treatment thing actually really helps because I'm telling me the story. So I have everything in, in mind, but when I'm adapting it, how much information I put in, I can be a little bit more like, you know what? I don't need all of this on, on there, but I know what, you know, basically, because right. it's almost like going through and erasing parts rather than, you know, like, it's not that I've left it out. I literally like, or that I didn't know. I do right. know I left little bits out. And I actually, that's what I, I'm really influenced by Asian horror myself. Mm -hmm. So I love not knowing every single thing, you know, like I love when to me, the unknown is what makes horror horror. Mm -hmm. Like, and the moment we know everything, it's less, you know, when you think of your own, I'm assuming you have paranormal experiences. Look at me. I'm like, yeah, you know, when you I, have your, I, I have had, I've had some, I've had some, I actually yeah. have. So it was never explained that like, you didn't get a wiki page after saying like, Hey, this is what happened to you. Right. Like it's always that, like you have room. And to me, that's where real scares actually are because you know, that's where you're filling things in and you're like, Oh, I wonder if it was this. And uh, yeah. And, and to me, I've always liked the idea that films or any sort of art of any sort should be a dialogue. Like I feel like your opinion is just as important as my opinion. Like I may have an answer, but I love the fact that you might have a totally different interpretation and that's actually the dialogue that we're having. Yeah, and, and that's what I, I really liked about uh, the Curse of Willow song is is I kind of pieced together myself and, and I got invested in a little bit more in it. And uh, doing it black and white, I loved black and white because uh, I think it really gives you a different perspective of what you're watching versus being in color because you actually focus more on certain things than mm -hmm. when there's all kinds of color. Don't get me wrong. I love color. Don't get me wrong. I, you know, I'm not, I'm not totally old school, but I do like black and white because I think it helps draw your focus better. Is that, was that kind of your uh, reason maybe behind it was, was the black and white or, you know, or was it just yeah. the, going for that classic feel? I went for the classic feel because it was my influence, but, but also once we actually started filming, what we realized was that, the shadows, you know, the darkness of it, that it really had that noir feel to, to it. And I realized that when you actually, like, we actually had my monitor in black and white as well. So oh, we nice. shot, so that way, what I saw was what we were going to get. And so mm -hmm. we kind of did that as a, as, a, as a choice just to make it easier. But what I really found was that um, our lighting really changed, our framing changed a lot. Like as in, you know, sometimes you can do like, obviously in color, you do a hit of color, you know, there's a theme to it here it was like wow we're really looking at shapes and um framing became a huge issue so the idea that uh, my my um director of photography thomas billingsley who i work with all the time we came up with this language where she was always willow was always filmed off center or behind mm -hmm. something so that the idea that she's never not been incarcerated her world even in prison or outside of prison still feels like a prison cell to her so it was uh just playing with that sort of stuff which I think it's less obvious when you've got color because you've got lots of texture and color to play with. Whereas here, it's very stark. Those are shapes and angles and 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 that. Well, the starkness definitely. Uh, the 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 emptiness. That's one of the things the old black and white films really you notice is emptiness or dead air or you know the, the hiss from the recording back in the but especially space in here it felt like space was really important uh at least visually when i was watching it because uh especially near the end when wolf catches up to her or whatnot you know just that empty room and even the warehouse it was still sparse and even when she was in her halfway house uh which by the way uh Doing the POV, you made me angry in a good way. I got very, I got very angry at pretty much everybody who talked to Willow Song. Okay. Yeah. You know what's interesting? I went back and reread my novella and I didn't realize that I'd done this, but I wrote it in second person. So mm -hmm. you're Willow. I, mm -hmm. I, like when I went back to read it, I was like, I wonder why I did this. Like sometimes I, I write things and I literally, like I'm a dog that leaves a room. I was like, what room? You know, like, yeah. So I did that. 
but I went back to read the script and, uh, or the story and I realized, oh, I wrote the thing in second person, like your Willow, when you do this, blah, blah, blah. And so it made sense when I was actually adapting it that there was a lot of talking to us in camera as if we were Willow. And so I, I really wanted to be in her space. And and you definitely put her it, it put us in her space because I got frustrated at the social worker. I got frustrated, especially at the boss guy. I wanted her to like, I'm like, oh man, you know, and then even with Wolf, you know, facing Wolf, it's like that really had an effect on me in, in a good way. I was like, man, I can't wait. I, I want I was hoping for that shoe to drop, and you do drop the shoe out here, so to speak, uh in the third act, which I appreciate quite a bit because I was like, Yes, please, I need some come up in this film. <laughs> That's so awesome. Um, did you feel claustrophobic? Did it make you feel a little bit like was when I was when I would when, when we're in her half in her house the the rehab the the halfway house very claustrophobic especially when she's in there with flea um it felt felt very claustrophobic and then it felt a little less when she was in the warehouse and then when she was hiding again and you have the room full of chairs which was was uh, was great uh it got claustrophobic again so it, it is kind of a expanding contraction feel to it. See, going back to our conversation about the TARDIS, I'm really yes. all about space, like ba basically being too big or too small. Like, and both of those feel terrible to me. I don't, I neither like being in like that discombobulated, like I have too much space, nor do I want to be squished. So I, I think that my own paranoia of the either size basically <laughs> comes across in, in the film. I just wanted to know if anyone else felt it. Um, the construction worker boss literally is almost verbatim my experience on, um, I was getting my Nexus pass renewed for you know the Canada yeah. US border thing, and the guy basically was the construction boss, oh. and he had all my paperwork, and I was just sitting like, and of course when you're powerless, someone has your birth certificate, you know your your passport, they have everything, and they're just like they're just drawing out this conversation, and you're trying to be polite because they kind of hold all the power. It's a hard it's a hard thing. I was just trying to like you know just remember what that was, and yeah. It, it was supposed to be a five minute interview and it, it ended up being 20 minutes of him grilling over like, oh, like what kind of films do you make? And I was like, oh no, oh, we've no. done so <laughs> It's a terrible conversation. Please give me my passport back. <laughs> I mean, it, and that's the thing is like within a minute of the conversation, you know where it's going. And like I said, it, it was, it was, it was getting me angry. I was like, I was like, oh man, I, I <laughs> oh, but I mean, you know, it's supposed to, I mean, I think that's where horror is most effective. And that was another thing that I appreciated quite a bit in this film is uh, not as many jump scares. I, I don't get me wrong. I think jump scares have their place and when used sparingly, <laughs> and, but I think more of the horror is just the background of stuff. Like you had in here, Wolf peering through the blinds watching and, and her not knowing or, you don't exactly trust what happened to Flea, and you wonder what happened to Flea because Flea's looking like seriously, like, you know, I like that type of horror more so than Boo. Yeah, I I think that our lives are horrifying enough, don't you think? Like it's in, and that's what I was trying to get across, which was the monsters in her head. I don't know if they even compare to the monsters that she's been dealing with, you know, in that in that world that she's living in, and. Um, yeah, just trying to make our everyday lives actually kind of horrifying, which I <laughs> sometimes <laughs> want. <laughs> and, and in here as well, I mean, horror always is a great conduit, I think, for commentary. Um, I think people overlook horror. Oh, it's about blood, gore. And that. I'm like, they're morality plays. They're, they're, they're a way to address hot topics that you might not even realize you're being addressed. And you, I, I, I felt, and I may be wrong, but I felt you had that here with Willow's song with she's just trying to do right. She know, you know, and we even find out later a little more about her character, no spoilers, but uh, she's trying to do right. And the system fights her every step of the way. And I think some people might think, oh, this is over-exaggerated, but this isn't, is it that over-exaggerated to what actually happens? No, um, I did a lot of research, you know, just around, I have a lot of friends who work in social work and, and, and uh, you know, and, and Vancouver, I don't know, I'm sure it's like many other cities where 
um, you know, basically the, our, our poorer areas are, and our more challenging areas are very much butted up against the more affluent areas. So right. it's like, you can't be blind to what's actually happening to the, to the world around you. And so I, I think that was really important to me. And I actually, I'm so glad you said it because to me, that's the, the way we use horror. Like it's everything from Godzilla basically being like the Japanese experience of, of nuclear war to, you know, it's always been an allegory or a commentary on mm. some tough things that we don't really want to deal with. And the best horror actually is like commentary on some level, you know, like right. you look at fairy tales. I mean, they're all morality plays, you know what I mean? Like before they even got cleaned up as like the Grimm's fairy tales, it was always like kids being boiled in ovens and you know, like, just like shoved it. Like, don't go there, you know, there's a witch in there. And, and you know, they're always like, you know, it, it's sort of like ways that we can actually live in our, and navigate our lives better. Yeah, and and that's why I appreciate the genre. And I think it it gets mislabeled sometimes because there is it, there are just the gore ones, the entertainment ones, you know, that aren't really making as much of a statement. But I mean, even my favorite horror movie, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, you know, you look at that and, and you're like, that's kind of a statement on how rural America is abandoned mm -hmm. by people and left to their own devices. And if you, if you leave it too far gone in the remote areas, things can take a, a turn. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the brilliance of that filmmaking all the way through, like, we, I think we keep going back to these classics and, and, you know, those big wides, you know, where you're like, Oh my God, punch in. And the tension of not seeing, what we want to be basically be seeing. Like, I, I think that sometimes with modern horror, we can get so caught up in showing everything. Whereas when you look at our favorite classics, like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, like the original, it's like these big, you know, like, oh no, we want to get closer. I can't see what's happening. You know, like, and that's the excitement of what we're actually seeing. Like when we actually see Leatherface, you know what I mean? It's just like, yeah, it's the, it's a holding back when we, when we can, so that it does fall at, at the end, but we're not basically over explaining or over showing, you know. And, and, you, <laughs> and you've got that you've got that here in uh, uh curse of will's song is we don't see there's something going on behind willow there's something going on that's connected to willow but we don't really get to see the whole thing until like the very end of mm -hmm. and even then like you said we you're not holding our hands so you're like well, what was that what what is going on and what I always love is the question when you get a good horror film, uh, what happens next? You know, where <laughs> does this go from here? You know, because I I am I am connected to Willow Song and and I want to know what happens next now. Yeah. You know? It's it's nice to know that because again, I, I think a good horror always leaves with the question. You know, sometimes we do a, a, a sequel, but a lot of times it's nice when we don't, you know, it's just yeah. like, oh like, I wonder what happens to her and I wonder where she is and what happened to it. But, um, you know, and, and little things like I'm, I'm happy that, you know, if you can fill things in, but I've known um, friends uh, or it, it's, it's a thing that I actually found, which was that sometimes with drug addiction, um, a lot of, I didn't realize this, a lot of uh, people who have psychic abilities, et cetera, mm -hmm. might actually start doing drugs and, and that right. because you're trying to mask it. It's actually a way of actually dealing with it. So, you know, like there's little hints all the way through of, who she is, why she got to this place where she is, how long has she had her abilities, how long have these nightmares plagued her, and basically all the choices that she's made. And it's all there, but it's just not spelled out in a way that, you know, you're like, oh, there it is. I, you know, like there's, yeah. And you get that through the dialogue and that through Danny and and her, uh, her brother and that. You have that conversation when she's kind of in that one uh, mental state. Uh, you know, th this whole cast, it's, it's, it's a smaller cast, but everybody seemed to play off each other well. Was this a group of folks you had worked with before, or did it take some time to find them? Or, yeah, I, I mean, my favorite way of casting, to be honest, is that you know, I I tend to um, stalk my Facebook feed for friends who are actors. So then I kind of look around and people that I want to work with, and uh, sometimes I'll design characters around who they are. Sometimes it's like, oh, I haven't seen them do this before. I'm going to make them like, I'm going to give this the, the worst haircut ever. This is, this will be fun. You know, like, so there's a slight like sadistic cruelty in, in this sure. as well. But um, a lot of times uh, in this case, I was working with a lot of actors that I um, worked with sometimes in smaller roles, sometimes in bigger roles and just kind of expanding and, and creating it for them. So it's always fun when I can do that. Yeah, uh, Valerie Tian uh, really puts in a great performance, but also Ingrid Nilsson, because 
her flea you're frustrated with that character so much and that's from her performance she really seems to seem to really get into that role and those two played off each other did they have some time to spend like to get familiar with one another before the movie started or yeah i mean the the thing for me is that i don't tend to do rehearsals but Mm. my actors often like i love that they go off and do the rehearsals and i love being surprised the reason I don't do rehearsals isn't because I'm like, you know, oh, I don't do rehearsals. I'm happy if they do. But I I, I love the element of surprise for me as a, mm-hmm. as a director, because uh, maybe because I also work in documentary. But sometimes I love not being in that sort of control. I love actually seeing like, oh, they did this to their character. Like once I've written a character and we've had a talk about it and, you know, I might incorporate some, you know, notes and mm-hmm. thoughts from the actors. Then I love to hand it over to them. And essentially, they inhabit this character. And at this point, I'm merely filming what they're bringing to the table rather than, yeah. So it's a it's it's both controlled and not controlled, you know? <laughs> so, so you have a lot more, because I know there's some directors of that that are like, that's not what we have in the script. And mm-hmm. and I want you to do this. And it sounds like you have more of a collaboration with, with your yeah, other cast. Yeah, of basically being able to see that they brought something to it. Like, but, you know, with Ingrid, we worked together quite a lot. And uh, actually, I just directed her in a brand new short film that she pitched me the story. It's sort of based on Flea. Like, it's funny because there's some key moments in it that we had kept going back to that were actually from Ingrid's experiences. And um, I wrote that into a script after she sort of, you know, wrote out the storyline. And uh, we just finished a short film. So, you know, I love working with people again and again, if we can actually, you know, just keep expanding on our relationship and how we're working. But um, yeah, I just think it's really important to me that I am not, you know, the be all end all for this. Because to me, once we come together and we're working, it's like there's something special that happens in that collaboration that isn't just all from my head. Like if it was really all me, it would be me, some hand puppets, a kazoo and my iPad. Like it would that, <laughs> be like a film by Karen Lamb. It would literally be me doing all the voices. But given the fact that it isn't, it's a collaborative medium, then it's like basically I'm creating sort of like a party atmosphere where people can come and bring their stuff, you know, and we can actually uh, have some fun with it. Well, and then they feel more invested in it too. And it, it might feel uh, like you said, uh, more organic, which you were kind of going for before with them, because this is something that they, they've they kind of attached themselves to. You're not just being told to do this. This is part of me. But yeah, the Flea character was both frustrating and sympathetic all the way through. Even at the end, I still felt some sympathy for Flea, even though I was like, oh. <laughs> I'm glad. Because, you know, she's still one of my favorite characters. Uh, it's funny, I was thinking about different characters that I've written over the years. And she's still one of my favorites because to me, uh, I really think that being like doing the right thing, having great morality, doing, you know, basically being kind, all of that, sometimes that's really attached to our privilege. You know, when you're literally trying to survive and you're scrabbling and you have had like the worst upbringing, sometimes like you just aren't making the right decisions maybe you know like they're they're covering your own butt a lot of times and I I I have respect for someone who's a a true survivor and she's a survivor like and that's how I I look at her well and she was a good opposite to uh Willow because she's almost as if what if Willow decided not to make her good decisions or try to still improve herself (laughs) that that could be Willow easily Enough. Yeah, and it's easy to fall off the wagon. You know, when you see Flea coming down the street and she's back on, you know, basically back on whatever substance she's on, it's heartbreaking. And I see it again and again just on our streets. You know, like sometimes you'll you'll meet people and they're in a good state, and then you see them like unfortunately a few weeks later, and you're like, oh no, what happened? You know, and it's it, yeah. So it is unfortunately like the it's the it's the reality of our world, and you know the pandemic did not make things easier. I don't know about your cities, but oh <laughs> no. my god gotten worse everywhere it, it feels like the social net just fell apart and so yeah it it really got mixed up and 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 messed up and a lot of people i think got left behind especially during the pandemic in in certain cities and that and it just you're still seeing the fallout from it uh yeah. quite a bit yeah it's just terrifying like i i keep thinking to myself are these end times is this it like are we in armageddon <laughs> <It's> like, are <laughs> there horsemen because there's already pestilence and war right like i'm like it's a hmm. famine you know where's the pale rider i'm I'm seriously in that zone right now of like oh my god this is it 
if it is the apocalypse, I'm going to need to get more armor on my car. I got to put some spikes on it or whatnot. You know? you know, that was the most disappointing thing about our pandemic. I thought to myself, like, I thought there'd be zombie hordes and instead I'm just buying toilet paper. I was like, really? That's like, huh. You know, I, I thought I'd look like Mad Max and there'd be like, you know, I'd be there's like, you know, guitarists would be there. I'd be wearing buttless chaps, you know, like I, I had this thing planned and it, instead it's just me like, where's the toilet paper? You know, it's just sad. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The most fights you have is, is fighting for toilet paper and, and rice <laughs> and, and, and meat oh. at the counter and, and yeah, the grocery store. And you're just like, oh, sourdough bread. That seems yeah. to be what we thought. Like we sat around making sourdough for a year. Like, I don't, I, I it's like, really? That's our pandemic. That's kind of lame. <laughs> And, and I always wonder, you know, you can see the influences, obviously, of the pandemic on the horror community. And I always wondered, it was similar to, you know, when you have major real life events that are, are horrific, like the pandemic and even like 9-11, horror seems to change quite a bit of what people will actually respond to how, how do you mm -hmm. adapt to that because that's the I, that sounds like it would be a challenge because you're like well i could write this but that's not going to match anything that just happened down the no, street it totally screwed me over because you know in my mind prior to the pandemic people behaved in a rational sort of way and then they didn't and then i was like so if i rewrote like a zombie film now you would have to have people saying like zombies don't exist come bite me you know what i mean like i was like is that what we do now like I this isn't making any sense and so it was illogical on such a, a large level and so and actually during the pandemic I had a really hard time writing I just was it was almost like um you know I, I always think my writing and and our creativity sort of comes from one central source I don't know like a motherboard <laughs> plugging in but I think our motherboard was so screwed at that point that I was plugging in it was just static so I was yeah. like I'm not writing anything then. Like I, I know some people did, but I I know for me it was just like seriously radio static is all I got. So I it took me until I think I'm starting to get my creative juices back. But you know it took it it took a while. Like I wasn't uh, it was just like blank page. And I never have like the blank cursor with nothing where I didn't feel like doing anything. And I was like nah, just gonna sit here on the couch and think about my sourdough. You know like I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh yeah, and it, it, it's it's interesting too because one thing though the pandemic I think did do is kind of uh, uh, confirm what horror writers have been showing for ages. You know, some of those dumb decisions. They're like, oh yeah, people wouldn't really be like that. No, <laughs> people really wouldn't choose. No, it turns out, yeah, yeah. no. <laughs> yeah, they did. Yeah, they totally did. I like, each time again, it's like, huh? Like I really seriously have to rethink zombie movies and contagion movies. <laughs> Like both of those are now like, well, that's not how it turns out at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got people looking at it going, yeah, no, I, I've been through worse. This isn't scaring me at all. No. Yeah. No. <laughs> and it actually made us rethink. I, I think that too, like, you know, we, we I think we got so bored at some point too, just being on our couches, like how we wanted to consume things. Like, uh, you know, the first year you're like, yeah, I'm going to watch all the things on my couch. And then at some point you're like, I want to watch nothing on my couch. I want to, <laughs> I just want to, yeah. I think this last year mm -hmm. I've spent more time in actual theaters than I have in my entire life, just mm -hmm. because I'm so happy to be around other humans on a big screen. And I know that, you know, we're dicey as far as what's happening coming up, but I'm like, I just want to be around people watching films together where we're laughing or screaming together. Like I, I, Yeah. Now, have you had a chance to see the Curse of Willow song on the big screen? Did, did you get a chance to get a theatrical release for it? I got uh, during the film festival, we had some limited screenings that mm -hmm. were, um, you know, smaller audiences. Right. And so it was int like, I, I so miss that, too, because then people actually just so that people know, too, this like it is darkly funny. It's not meant to be so right. serious. Mm -hmm. And so it was nice to actually have an audience because people would actually laugh at some of the lines. And I'm like, oh, good. It was intended to be like. It's not deadly serious. It is, uh, yeah. There's some yeah. lines that are actually supposed to be dark funny. Yeah, there, there's, there's humor. I did feel the humor involved, especially. Uh, I, I'm not going to completely spoil, but I'm just going to say the eye gimmick. I loved the eye gimmick uh, near the end of the film. I, I just that made me smile so much. Uh, cool. But yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, you, you do work in humor. Maybe not so much as uh, your other work, which uh, I did see. Uh, the uh, bring it on, cheer or die, which you look like you're having, you must have, you had fun with that one quite a bit. And it's a different tone, but uh, it's 
Willow I actually made beforehand sure. and uh, the studio actually really liked what I did on that and that's how I got hired on to bring it on but it's so funny because that was one of the things that they were worried about I was like your films are a little serious you know like this is comedy and I was like no I swear I'm not that not funny <laughs> Uh, well, it, it it's hilarious, and I I loved the spirit of it, the the slasher spirit. And I actually have seen your uh, short film, The Doll Parts, because I have oh. Shevenge. I got a chance to to review Shevenge, and uh, I watched Doll Parts, and that, I I remember Doll Parts quite a bit because that was a surprising one as well. Yeah, and you recognize the boss is the guy that's a yeah. So that's yeah. my friend Dave. Like, try to kill as often as possible, but he survived uh, Willow. So if I. <laughs> sit around and think of ways that I could kill David. So he's lovely. He's and so maybe maybe a short spit off for Willow. You could kill him in that. So there you go. Construction worker boss from hell and kill him, right? <laughs> there you go. He 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 shows up at her address going, you know, I could still give you a job. Ah! And there you go. See there you <laughs> I love it. I would totally do that. So uh, I, I gathered, uh, looking at your body of work and just from talking to you, that, that you're a horror fan. Uh, well, I know that it's always a hard, difficult this choice for me. My friends give me crap about it because I'm like, what's your favorite movie? And I'm like, well, choose the genre, the mood, and the day. But do you have one <laughs> in particular that you like go to a lot? You know, it's it's all very mood driven and it's all very, um, very much like what I tended to be researching at the time, you know, and, and, and that. But yeah, I I mean, what again, you've had the same thing, too, I'm sure. The things that you think are comedic are not comedic for anyone else. Right. Like you're like, ah, this was darkly funny. And they're like, that was not funny. What did you just laugh all the way through? Like I went to like one of my favorite, um, like I love Korean, those serial killer thrillers. Oh, sure. <laughs> and so I, I remember seeing, I saw the devil, which I love by the way. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember sitting next to this teen guy in, 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 in the thing and I was laughing. I thought it's awesome. Like the, you know, with the Achilles heel and all the, the sluts and I was laughing and there's the cannibal scene. And I was laughing through that. And when the credits rolled, he turned to me, I was like, I don't think you're well lady. <laughs> <laughs> We, we just had we just had that conversation uh with the green inferno i saw the green inferno at the theater and my friend uh, she went with me uh and and she got a kick out of it because i was like giggling and and rocking in my chair and, and trying to stifle laughs as the horrific things were portrayed out on the screen yes! you yes! know and I, i'm just I'm, I'm laughing or uh you know i watched uh uh evil dead trap and evil dead trap too and there's parts of that that just had me laughing that i know i probably shouldn't be laughing at no, no, it should be this is the thing like whenever i sh whenever my films screen in regular you know sure and, and willow screened more at a lot of more conventional film festivals like so it did its mix of like horror and genre festivals and conventional things like i think conventional like audiences are quite serious about the whole thing. But what I find and what I love about our horror crowd is that we laugh all the way through and they, they get all our funny. You know, as filmmakers, we're like, oh, I thought this was supposed to be funny. And then you, you know, you're sitting with a regular audience and they're like, oh my God. What's... And then you watch it with a horror audience and we're dying. Like we're just killing ourselves. And I'm like, I'm amongst my people. Like this, <laughs> we all get what this actually is. And so I, it, it makes me happy to, like, again, if you can find a great horror festival to be at, you're basically amongst your people and you could all laugh together at the same horrible things. And so, <laughs> yeah, we were just, we were uh, uh, here and I'm in the middle of probably the farthest away from anything. I'm in the middle of Wisconsin. So I, I'm <laughs> like away from anything Hollywood, but we have our horror fest. So we have an indie film community, which I discovered about 11, 12 years ago and have been trying to, bring uh, a light to ever since been supporting quite a bit but one of the films i ran across was ed Gein the musical <laughs> oh my god what, what? yes there's oh there's god. an ed Gein the musical uh it, it came out like 10 or 12 years ago and then it got re-released for like a 10th anniversary or whatever it's hilarious you know but people are like you're laughing at ed Gein. i'm like it's it's yeah <laughs> yeah of course we are <laughs> of course we are it, you know, and I think I think that's another thing, uh, like a stigma on some horror fans. They're like, how can you watch that? It's like you watch that because I think, as you said, real world tends to be even more horrific. But at the end of the day, regard pretty much regardless, some of the movies, yeah, but most of them you watch, you go, 
yeah, they yelled cut. The person stood up and and they went about their business. They're still alive. It's not like you're watching, you know, uh, hopefully you're not watching real deaths. On, uh, you know, you're just, but no, you enjoy no, no. it. You realize yeah. that this is all make believe when you're watching something like this. And I think if you can let go of that, you have more freedom to enjoy it a little more. And like you said, laugh maybe a yeah, little bit you know, more. You think of us in camp when we were little and you're putting a flashlight under your chin and you're trying to scare everybody else you know like that's the fun of horror to me and honestly um you know I've directed like more dramatic things you know and and, but mainly I stay with horror but mainly because we have so much fun making horror like you know like there is nothing more fun I'm sorry to say but bring in the blood you know like I think ah and so it's like it's like you have to because as a filmmaker like my my thing is that you have to film everything without the blood first you you know Mm -hmm. once the toothpaste is out of the the two right the two like the toothpaste back in so you have to run things dry and then get all your coverage first and then you can bring in the blood but i'm always excited once the blood comes out i'm like yes <laughs> yeah it's a cleanup because blood really stains like all mm. fake literally turns everything pink so and then you get all the different formulations and i love when my like special effects teams like this is why i love to do horror they're like okay hey, how gloopy do we want it it's like oh is that jam you know like i want the clots in it i want clots on this one it's like oh that one's too purple not like too purple but oh, that's too pink you know and i right. love coming up with the the shades and the formulations and you know you're a geek when that happens you're like oh yeah love that like i was driving around for a long time with a bucket full of pus in my back seat and i was like please don't let me get pulled over because i've got body parts and pus in my back seat and i just cannot explain any of what's happening mm-hmm. so though though if they pull you over they're like uh excuse me babe and take you downtown you're like wow those special effects artists are really good they convinced the guy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly it was like, like with doll parts i had the hand like yeah. all those little they were in my back seat for the long like in the back trunk for the longest time so every so often i'd like you know you you slam on the brakes and i have an suv like a hand would come rolling (laughs) yeah pay pay no attention to the hand under the the don't worry about it (laughs) give the person a hand you know it's like all the terrible things like evil things are a foot (laughs) (laughs) no no they're they're a hand actually (laughs) Uh, no, you know you mentioned gore uh that's another thing people are like oh how can you watch gory films i'm like are you talking killing you know a dead alive freaking brain dead is, is brilliant from from the guy who brought you lord of the rings right <laughs> yes oh god yes like it's like a and it's funny because when you watch lord of the rings you totally know peter jackson still loves you know what i mean it's like oh he's excited now because i'm excited <laughs> So yeah, he's our people. <laughs> he's definitely our people. Yeah, you know, because one of my favorite movies is a movie that the director hates. Uh, I love Maximum Overdrive. It's one of my one of my favorite oh, movies. Yes. And I'm and quoting that one, I don't know why, but I've I've been in this like you know what if all my like all my things are out to get me. I, I've had I've had moments of that actually in the last while. So I'm so it, glad you mentioned it because I haven't seen it in forever, and I think I need to re rewatch it. It, it's so over camp, you know, and Stephen King said, oh, well, I was kind of high on cocaine at that time when I made it and I didn't like it. I'm like, it's such a wonderful energy to it. That just this crazy film. It's It's got all the elements though still of Stephen King, you know, all those signature mm-hmm. things. But at the same time, it says if he's doing a B movie, you know, so you've got your blue collar worker, you got your steer, you, you got your, all your King elements. It's just as if, you know, he made this B movie. <laughs> and, and that's yeah. what I love, you know. Uh, you know what? What things? Speaking of kind of differences in films, what kind of things from Willow's song did you bring to, uh, uh to cheer or die? You know, did, was there anything that you kind of brought to it? You know, they want. I think that I mean, I, I did bring my composer of all, of sure. all people, but they wasn't allowed to like not not wasn't allowed. But you know, it's a right. different vibe together. Right. But I think that um, it's funny because the studio, the way I treated it was. The opening part of Bring It On is part of the like Bring It On franchise, yep. mm-hmm. right? And I knew that by the time I handed it back to them, I wanted the ending to also be back in the franchise. But that whole middle bit was pretty well mine. So I'd say nice. from second act onward, they were like, go to town. And I, I got to actually, you know, do something that was uh, light and fun. And the, 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 the hardest thing was, um, and it, it's actually that way in Willow as well. I didn't want to show, and we weren't allowed to show any real blood, you know, right. like, so mm-hmm. when I first got the, the script for it, 
you know, technically I didn't, I wasn't supposed to write it, but you know, you, you, you have to yeah. just for production. But um, the first draft of the script that I ended up with was quite a lot more, like it was a lot bloodier and there was a lot, a lot of things, but I couldn't do that because we were at, on a PG-13. And so I really did have to think about how much blood and if so, what are we seeing? And can, can I actually go for a funny ha laugh scare at the same time so there was uh, there was definitely that but I think the studio was really much like they were like you know what that middle part you know you go to town on your horror stuff and so like a lot of the atmosphere and stuff like that that was it like you know just the creeping down hallways and that sort of stuff is something that I I love doing so yeah your, your locations for both films were fantastic uh do you do you take some time to really seek out your locations uh yeah for your films Definitely. The locations often, like if you get a good location, it takes care of so much of your work, you know, mm -hmm. like just having lots of different angles, different things that you can play with texture, you know, it's always good. Right. And uh, with the school that we filmed um, Bring It On In, it was actually in an abandoned school. And part of the problem is that we had actually all these hallways. And then before we went in, it turned out that two of the hallways had asbestos and we had to plug those up. So I literally only had two hallways to dress up and down and I had to make it feel like a big labyrinth of a school. You know what I mean? And so that was, that was challenging because I had two hallways that were not flooded and as best, like do not lick the whip, like walls. It was just very, yeah. You, you just, you just take the doctor who stands, right. And just keep running down the same hall, just different angles, but down the same hall. It was totally, it was so doctor who in that way. Like, <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely, um, you had to be really inventive. Like, you know, can we play with the lighting? Can we play with the angle? Can we like dress it a little bit differently? Like moving, just just being a little bit more creative. And I did want the abandoned school to be like, where you couldn't figure out the the look, like mm -hmm. just the, where anything was like a TARDIS, you know, like this school gets bigger and bigger. What's happening to it? So, yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, both films are a lot of fun and doll parts, and, and, and I've really enjoyed your work, and I'm going to be checking out the other stuff. Um, what advice would you have, I guess, for the final question here, is for an up-and-coming, especially a female filmmaker who maybe wants to get into horror or whatnot, what, what kind of advice would you give them? I would definitely say, like, start with a short film, you know, like, and nowadays we can really afford to do them. Like, you can film it on your, you know, like, our cell phones are good enough right, right. now, and you you can you can actually start making things like that but starting with like a good script or a, a writing something that actually speaks to you like I I think that what I've tried to do again and again in all of my films short and small and I still love doing short films by the way so I am not like I'm only features of this I love short films because it's a chance for us to play and um I think it's as much as possible finding the horror in really personal stories if you can you know, like, I, I think we've all seen enough of five stupid te teenagers go to the woods and get butchered, right? Like that we've seen quite a few times. Sure. But if you bring something really personal to it or something unusual and you can find the horror angle to it, that to me is like, wow, like that sets that that sets you up into something doing doing something original. Fantastic. Well, uh, where can they keep up with your stuff when, uh, you know, th with what projects you're coming up? Because it sounds like you always have something in the fire. Uh, you got a social media site or where can they follow you? Okay, this is really embarrassing. My social media that is available to everyone is mm. unfortunately on Instagram and, and it's my cats. So because... <laughs> I am not even me. I'm my cats. And I literally am the human that services these two creatures. So um, it's a uh, Mateo underscore Sophia. They're twin tuxedo cats. And I literally, again, and Sophia with an F. So Mateo and Sophia are my two cats. I brought them to, like, when I was filming Bring It On, we were in Winnipeg. Yeah. So, you know, it's closer to your neck of the woods. And I'm sure, actually yeah. from Manitoba myself. So I, I, I know where you are. <laughs> so, um, yeah, basically, I that was the biggest negotiating tactic that I had with the studio. They're like, uh, is it pay? Is it nothing? I was like, no, my cats have to be there. So anyway, that's just sad. <laughs> anyway, so Mateo slash under, underscore uh, Sophia underscore. And uh, I try to do some stuff there. I have a website, Karen Lamb Films, but I need to uh, update it. So that's uh, some of my <laughs> old. So, yeah. Yeah, everybody I think has a, a website they have to update. Uh, you know, everyone tough. does, right? You, you do really well for the first two years, and then you're like, oh, a website, what what was that? And then people are like, oh my God, okay, I need to update that big time. And yeah, so, I, yeah. I've, I've got that too. There's some links where they're really great and other links to where they, I, well, I haven't updated that in like a year. I'm like, that's a year old. 
you know, I have not updated since the pandemic. So that's bad. Like, I feel like, oh, <laughs> like to me, that's the three years that became one. And it's like, speaking of TARDIS years, I'm like, I don't know what's happening. Like it's, it's sped up and it slowed down. So it, it definitely threw, I think, everybody's internal clock off though. So <laughs> <laughs> wasn't the first year, the longest year you've ever spent. And then all of a sudden this year seems to be like a really fast year. Like how are we in September? Like, it's, yeah, yeah. It, it was just May. It was literally just May. <laughs> yeah. And then something happened and now we're in September and I'm like, is it soon going to be December? Like what's happening? Wait, yeah. I'm, I, I feel like we played mini putt and we went in the clown's nose and we should have gone through the mouth instead. And we got shot out some other like bowl. And I'm like, I'm very confused. So. Yeah. <laughs> I think we all are, but folks, you will not be confused uh, when you see a uh, curse of Willow song, or if you go and uh, watch uh, bring it on cheer or die or, like I said, Doll Parts, check it out on She Venge. It's a great uh, anthology of uh, female driven horror. Uh, you know, thank you so much, Karen, for this. Folks, check it out. Uh, Curse of Willow Song will be on digital and DVD September 26th. So, uh, you know, it, it, within a few days so of this recording. So I thank you very much, Karen. And yeah, check it out, folks. You will not be disappointed. <laughs>